so, so we are going to speak um, in the next hour uh, with our partners about a very important topic for Schneider Electric, co-innovation, and how do we engage with our ecosystem uh, for, for co-innovation. And I think it's a very important uh, topic that we have to put in the context of how we, we see uh, digital uh, uh, disrupting uh, the landscape uh, and the traditional boundaries of our industries for a company like Schneider Electric. Uh, and for us it's about uh, disrupt, uh, start a trend, organize things differently or be disrupted. So we have decided to be a leader instead of being a victim. And we want to do this together with our ecosystem and together with our partners we want to drive this trend, we want to embrace co-innovation with our partners in order to deliver more values to our customers and to our partners. Um, when, uh, when, when we look at all this, I think it's important to consider that we need to have a different mindset. Uh, if you look at the world uh, where we come from, if you look at the legacy, uh, and if you look at a specific value chain, everybody in the value chain is focused on a specific slice of a problem. If I am a designer, I design. If I am an installer, I install. Uh, if I am an end user, I operate uh, an asset, I operate something. So we see it, it is siloed and it is asynchronous. All those different things are happening at specific moments, at specific time, with limited dependencies. Uh, in general, it's pretty, pretty centralized. There is always an actor that is the center point of all this, and that is kind of uh, agitating, moving all those different communities, and being the center point, and everybody else following. It's a very fragmented value chain. Uh, the, the first company I was mentioning, like the design one, is very, very far from the reality of the operations, which when you think about it, it's really a pity because you design something for a purpose. How can we get a better feedback about how this design became an actual installation and how this feedback about an actual installation can improve uh, future designs? Uh, it's a very company-centric product development. Everybody operates on categories that are well-defined. I do a better product in that category, but I'm not in a permanent engagement with customers, with context, with reality in order to do better product. And it's a single-sided market in terms of interaction because you operate in an environment where you are a producer and everybody you engage with is a consumer. <coughs> when you think about the digital world, I need to get some water. When you think about the digital world, really the first world that comes to my mind is real time. It's everybody interacting together uh, in real time <coughs> and in a very uh, uh, dynamic way. Sorry. With different actors playing different roles, uh, but, but all this is very uh, um, synchronized versus the asynchronous I was uh, describing. You, you cannot hear me? It's too loud? Okay. Um, digital means distributed. Because we have the capabilities uh, to have everybody interacting with each other, we can operate in a distributed environment. It's global, it's an extended value chain. Uh, when I say extended value chain, it means that on a specific industry, new, new actors are coming. The value chain is extended to players, and I will give an example after, that we are not traditionally engaged here. Um, when you think about IoT digital, you think about data. Uh, Ten years ago, we were not speaking about data scientists. Today, they become a very important part of the overall value proposal. You can have very sophisticated systems that produce a lot of data if you don't have the expertise to transform this data into a specific business value that doesn't make any, any sense. So we have new players, new actors coming onto those ecosystems. Um, it's a community and it's uh, centered on solving problems. It's not centered on producing, producing more technology, producing more capabilities, because there is such a diversity and there is such a fragmentation that we need to be able to focus on some categories of problems. And it's a multi-sided market because each of us as companies, we are for some aspect a producer, for some others a consumer, and we change roles all the time depending about uh, specific periods of place of the value chain, roles, responsibilities, and it changes all the time. So an another thing I want to highlight about digital is uh, 
the technology of digital is the present, okay? We are not thinking about different things that are going to happen in the future. Internet of Things is a reality today. Artificial intelligence is a reality today. Uh, more advanced in some industries, less in some other industries, but it's a reality. There are plenty of technologies that we can use and apply. Machine learning, okay, another version of it, same. Augmented reality, it's not... the it's a good example. The challenge of augmented reality is not the availability of the technology, it's the usage and the business value you make with that technology. So the present is already digital. The technologies are already available. What, what is really uh, uh, key and fundamental is how do we transform this potential and this technology into business value. And there is one point that comes in between of this, is data. Uh, because all those different technologies are either producing more data or need more data in order to produce more value. And you, you probably know this uh, statistic, but 90% of the data uh, that have been uh, generated uh, for connected things were just created, 90% were just created in the last two years. So if you compound this for the years to come, it's just absolutely tremendous and gigantic. But the problem for most of the uh, actors in the value chain, whatever role they play, is that it's not about having more data is what do you do with those data? How do you use those data? How do you interact with others around data in order to transform that data into more business value? So how do we transform this data into information, this information into insight that is more uh, meaningful to you, wherever you are in the value chain, not just an end user. Uh, if I am a designer, where do I get that data about actual operations that will allow me to make better design? If I am an installer, how do I know what actual problems a customer is facing so that I do a better uh, installation or I, I have less errors in my installation because I learn from the experience of others? So uh, w what we are going to discuss with our partners is really in this landscape of ecosystem, is this expanded landscape of ecosystem, uh, we, we have the example of buildings here, whatever we operate a building or we do transactions um, or, or we develop, modernize a specific facility, there are many, many different companies that have needs and that can provide capabilities, opportunities, information, data. How do we activate all this? How do we get organized together as a community so that we grow uh, the size of the pie, we create more value uh, that we can share in a better and in a different way? So, in, in order to, uh, to do this, um, I would like to invite uh, uh, on stage our, our panel speakers and I will uh, uh, let them, uh, when they are seated, uh, introduce themselves. Uh, and, and we have a good group uh, that is a, a good mix between uh, uh, consulting and integration with Accenture, uh, companies that are uh, uh, specifically operating uh, uh, in, in, this, uh, uh, in, in this environment. Uh, so, please come on stage and join me for the discussion. Welcome. So you should be seated close to your pictures in order not to confuse people. Welcome. 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 Sorry, 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 sorry. My mistake. Okay, I'll go back to this. So I, I need to have the headset, otherwise I, I cannot hear uh, your, your questions and what, uh, what you are saying. So, so maybe w w what I would like to, to say first, and, and, and it's good if each of you can, can answer to that question. So um, when, when we say digital transformation, so you have all customers uh, that are, uh, uh, you contribute to digital transformation. So can you, can you tell us, uh, uh, who you are, what you do, and, and, and what is your role in this uh, digital transformation of the world. So maybe we, we can start here. Hi, Cyril. Hi, everybody. Uh, just a show of hands, can you guys hear me? Okay, thanks. My name is Sid Harlalka. I'm from Accenture. And uh, as you know, we are uh, a partner for Schneider Electric. Um, and uh, we are uh, very, very big uh, on digital. In fact, over the last few years, um, we have completely pivoted to digital. A majority of our revenues come from digital now. Uh, specifically about myself, I'm based out of the Singapore office and I help uh, some clients who are serious about going on a digital and an innovation transformation journey. 
I'm also part of our innovation hub. We have a series of hubs around the world uh, where a small number of us uh, showcase and bring digital to life uh, with our ecosystem partner network. Thanks. Happy to be here. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my name is Chintan Soni. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Equilibrium Energy. We work with medium and large industrial and commercial energy consumers and help them on two fronts. One is um, optimization of cost of power, and second is increase the uptime of their equipments. Um, we have around um, 300 customers across 700 plants. Um, we we have close to 8,000 um, gateways installed in um, in India, and we get close to 8 GB of data every day. And that was a starting point. Um, and we pivoted where we've started to make sense out of the data that we get um, by telling them what's happening in their plant or their building and help them take actions um, which is derived out of the data that we get from these sensors. Um, happy to be here and uh, happy to participate in that. Jean-Marc? Yes. Uh, hi everyone, so I'm Jean-Marc Lazare. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Open Datasoft, which is a European-based uh, company uh, developing a leading solution for data sharing. And when we founded the solution uh, and the platform six years ago, uh, what we felt is that uh, co-innovation and data sharing will be one of the key elements of, uh, of innovation. Just think about the car industry. Uh, all the market, for example, now is expecting uh, to have autonomous car as quickly as possible. But an autonomous car won't exist without co-innovation and data sharing because you need a car maker, you need an OS maker, and you, you need electricity, uh, especially it's like Schneider Electric. And just like uh, this morning, Mr. Tricquart say, only 10% of the data is used. It means that 90% uh, of the data are still locked in silos and heterogeneous uh, environments. So what uh, we want to solve as a problem is to make all the stakeholders or specific uh, issues like smart cities, smart building and so on to share the data together and to drive to innovation. Alexander? Hi everyone, my name is Alexander Hill and I'm one of the co-founders of Sensei. Sensei is a scalable software product that helps industrial companies to reduce the impact of unplanned machine downtime. It does that by automatically learning from data that they already collect. It's a product that's designed really to be used by the maintenance team and the managers. It's not a data science product. So we try to simplify this data as much as possible and make it accessible to the guys who are responsible for making those machines do what they're supposed to do. Uh, I'm based in the UK. Uh, we have uh, projects all around the world. And we've been working with Schneider Electric on a number of different projects, and uh, very happy to be here. So, um, no? keep on. Yeah, I have a Madonna mic, as yeah, it is yeah. called. <laughs> I'm being slow. Uh, so, so, so moving, moving to the to the next question, where, where I'm interested to have your uh, your view. So, um, you all deal with specific type of uh, customers. So. Um, in this engagement with customers, in, in your specific context, what does co-innovation mean? Uh, do, do you innovate just between you and your customer, uh, but, or do you uh, uh, work with other companies? So how, how does it work in your space? Uh, wh what does co-innovation mean in your specific context? Who, who wants to start with that? I'll go first, because I've got the microphone. Uh, so co-innovation for us is Definitely the first part of we'll work with our customers and our customers will have certain expertise about their machinery and their operations that they don't want us to own, and that's fair enough. We don't want to own it either. It's not for us. It's not, uh, it's not in our interest to own it. So we will focus on making a scalable predictive maintenance product, and then our customers can sometimes come in and innovate their own improvements and their own algorithms that they can then add in. And it allows a, a clean separation between technologies and between property. But having said that, we also work with a lot of other companies that might sometimes do a very similar thing to us or will add value to that stack. Because Industry 4 is not about us owning the entire thing. It's not about everyone being able to, to provide that entire stack. It's about working together and playing to your strengths. 
So, so what kind of problem do you solve with an ecosystem that you could not solve alone? Give us some example. Okay, for example, um, so we will look at the predictive maintenance of a machine, but we have no idea and no interest in planning when that maintenance will actually take place. So there are other companies that will take the data from us and do some dynamic maintenance scheduling to understand when you should actually maintain that machine. All we provide is a, a uh, I say all we provide, all we provide is a, an estimation of risk and an estimation of uh, what we believe should be done. It's up to somebody else then to take that further and say, okay, I'm going to plan in at this particular time to perform that. So, so, so Jean-Marc, in, in the case of uh, Open Data Soft, I, I think you have, a, you have an interesting and different role because you are uh, really an, an enabler of, of co-innovation because you allow people to, uh, to, to share data. So t tell us more about uh, how, how, you, uh, how you enable this uh, co-innovation and what co-innovation means in your context. Yeah, sure. So if you're thinking about co-innovation, by design, it means heterogeneity. Heterogeneity of data in terms also of business models. So you, ha you have to make possible uh, to different stakeholders coming from various industries to cooperate. So as you know, data is the fuel of innovation and new economy. So it means that you basically, concretely, every day, you have to collect and to aggregate data coming from various ecosystems. And what we do is to connect this ecosystem. Just, me, just let me give you a concrete example. For a smart city project, for example, uh, when a city uh, asks for many reasons uh, to identify uh, vacant apartments in the city because uh, the city is crowded and you have to identify specific uh, vacant houses to, to drive your, your political uh, project, uh, the city cannot find the right data to, uh, in its own system to, to find the answer. So what is the city doing? She is looking for alternative, alternative data. And for example, alternative data could be uh, by an energy provider, thanks to the smart metering, and by analyzing the, the energy consumption, you can detect and identify some vacant housing uh, area in your city, and then find the, the beginning of an answer. That's what we, we, we try to do, connecting the dots between the provider and the reusers of the data, just assuming that everybody provides the um, has data to, to, to provide, but will need also the data of the others to, to drive its own innovation. So basically, we have this uh, exchange data platform, uh, Turnkey, to, to find out this uh, first type of solution uh, for our customers, which could be industrial as well as cities and any kind of uh, stakeholders in projects. So Shintan and Sid, do you want to add something uh, specific in your context? Yeah, I mean, um, for, for us as an organization, co-innovation has been really, really important. Um, when, when you look at data, and I think everybody is talking about that, that when you look at data, um, data is important, but what is more important is how do you make sense out of the data. And co-innovation has helped us on two fronts. First is the business front. Um, so when you look at data and when you look at the dashboard, does a CXO want to see um, a voltage, current, frequency chart. You know, he doesn't want to see that. Uh, but us, as engineers, we built a platform which is completely technology driven. But when you start innovating and start talking to your customers, you figure out what each person in an organization wants to see from the platform. And on the product side, we've co-innovated a lot with our customers. So what we've done is we have identified eight to 10 of our customers who have been with us through our journey. And we meet every three months, every quarter, identify what we've done on our product, and they give us inputs on what we should be doing on the product so that it is easily acceptable by the organization. And, and that has been the key. Um, we, we also co-innovate with energy auditors. You know, I got some good feedback from Schneider as well. Um, Accenture has played a big part in our co-innovation. Sid might not know, but there are, uh, um, there's a team in India who had given us first inputs on what the user interface should look like. Um, and I, I think innovation, uh, co-innovation is really important. Uh, you can't go far without it. 
So, so Seed Accenture is obviously not a startup, so that's, uh, you have a different perspective. Um, we, we are in a relationship uh, about co-innovation between Schneider Week and Accenture. A lot of the things that we have developed in the last three years um, uh, are the result of our collaboration. So w what is happening in your landscape? What is happening with your customers? How are they changing their innovation practice for digital? It's a great question and uh, gr great suggestions and answers from the panelists as well. So when we think about co-innovation, we have moved the needle from four or five years back where all the organizations started to talk about digital transformation or innovation. Now they're talking about speed, they're talking about agility, they're talking about targeting, P doing POCs and pilots on new ideas which are new to market, but at the same time they want to transform and grow the core, which is their staple business, and they are trying to leapfrog within the core of their business. Mm. And, uh, you know, I really like the chart that you had before that, which showed the entire ecosystem. Every single client of ours who's serious about going on a digital transformation, the first thing we do with the C-level is to paint a picture like that. Because we are very clear that Accenture alone can't do that. And we work with partners like Schneider Electric, and it's been what a wonderful journey it's been, Cyril, uh, with the digital services factory and enabling those skill sets. But also with technology players, um, you know, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, uh, with a lot of startups. Um, so ideas that are already there with the smaller companies where they already have ideas, being able to seed those ideas quickly within the framework while the core company and while Accenture can be in charge at the heart of the transformation journey. But without the entire innovation and without the co-innovation framework, that time scale would be two times or three times. So, so I hear in what you say, uh, uh, one dimension of co-innovation around uh, uh, on the mixing the different type of expertise together in order to solve some specific problem. I hear also speed. Co-innovating is about how do we bring a solution faster to the market. So uh, in, in in all your different bubbles of co-innovation, uh, how would it be important for you to expand the reach of that ecosystem? Uh, what could you do if you had access to more partners, different partners, new partners, uh, if you could expand this uh, bubble of co-innovation where, where you are in? What would it mean for you and your business? Sure. Whoever wants to start. Actually, maybe I can start with a small example. Um, SKF is one of the ball bearing, ball bearing cage manufacturers. And we started our journey and did a little bit of co-innovation with them um, in, in a plant in India. Um, where it was accepted so well that today we are actually expanded to three other geographies with SKF. And they are also talking about the plants outside India where we could go in and, and implement our, our platform. So, Innovation not only means business one time, but it sort of propagates your reach within the ecosystem and even outside, uh, and it definitely gets you more business. I mean, uh, that's the key at the end of the day, right? You all want to make money uh, while doing good things uh, which saves the planet as well. So you want, I you wanted to say something. Yes, um, I'd just like to add that uh, we have, within Accenture, uh, we are very serious about our own innovation ecos ecosystem and our architecture. And I was uh, mentioning earlier on that I'm part of the innovation hub uh, out of Singapore. And uh, this is a 15,000 square feet uh, uh, place uh, in, uh, in South, at South Beach Tower, which is one of the new buildings that has come up here. And we are providing the space for our partner networks. We've set it up. Uh, Schneider Electric has been a great partner within that. Uh, we bring it together, and then we have an uh, entire uh, uh, ecosystem with our startup communities uh, coming in there and trying to work on problems together. So being co-located, trying to solve specific problems, that's a great way to move ahead as well, something we've seen a lot of success around. Yeah. Uh Two weeks ago, maybe you, you've not noticed it, but Google launched a new service called Google Dataset Search. Maybe it's uh, well known by uh, early player in open data and so on, but it means that um, something is going on upon data, about data, meaning a kind of uh, internet and a wave of, web of data. So maybe one day, maybe pretty soon, uh, we will say, just like we, we did a few years ago, if you, your data sets and your data are not searchable, on Google dataset search, 
maybe you won't exist anymore in the industry because you won't be able to be fundable by co-innovators. So what I, uh, what I would like to, to say is that we, we invite everybody uh, not to open all, all the data, of course, there is a question of confidentiality and, uh, and security, but to, to think about it and to, to just to think uh, how to better share this resource and these assets, which are the data, uh, to be foundable, because now you will be found through your data, not only through the services. So, so I think what, what you said is, is important. I think if you want to find somebody that is going to solve your problem, you probably have to describe your problem in terms of data and, and have the right technology to be able to do this. So, so is it sufficient? Is it, is it just a matter of technology? No, I, I, I would say that it's, it's not yet anymore a question of technology, just we said it. It's a question of, uh, of uh, problem identification and resource you can use to solve it, just like data. And then, uh, if you want to, to lead to co-innovation and innovation, uh, basically, you will say, OK, I've got this problem. For example, the city of Paris, OK, well-known city. Every year, they have a challenge, which is called data city. And they say, OK, this has, these are my problems. And I've got this data and my... Uh, uh, partners have this data, Schneider Electric has this data, and so on. So, please, the community, can you help me to solve, thanks to technology sometimes, to solve this problem for the benefit of the citizens and the people living and making business in Paris? That's also a new way to, to address problems because you don't even know in advance what kind of solution you will find because of the speed, because the go to market expectation, and this is uh, the reason to co innovate. So, uh, Alexander, if we look at, uh, at uh, the example of Sensei, so let's imagine you have a, a, a new machine, a new equipment where you need to develop uh, predictive maintenance uh, solutions. Uh, where, where do you find the expertise uh, if, if this is a machine that you have never addressed, if it's a, a specific piece of technology on that machine that is new? Uh, how, how will you process? Do you engage with your, with your ecosystem? How, how do you get organized to find the expertise that you might not have? Quite an interesting question. Our approach to that is look at the data. So actually being more connected to data sources and maintenance sources. So we need machine data and maintenance data. That's where our, 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 the way that we learn and the way that we approach a machine that we've never seen before is just let the data speak for it. So we bring in the data. Now, of course, we need to have good quality data, and that's always a challenge. Uh, bring in the data, let the machine learning learn what normal behavior is and then what the maintainers do and go from there. And the more connected we become, the better the customer benefits mm -hmm. at, to the point where perhaps we can look at machines that are similar that aren't with that customer and we can share that learning. And so the customer, again, benefits from the interconnectedness of all of that. Thank you. So, so we spoke about um, ecosystems, co-innovation. We spoke a lot about data, uh, how to produce data, how to consume data. Uh, so so we, we, we spoke about how the digital world is changing the way uh, people approach innovation. So what I would like now is to take questions from the audience, uh, as we have another uh, 15 minutes to go, um, uh, and, and understand if you have uh, specific uh, uh, questions on this very uh, interesting topic of co-innovation. Carlos. There should be an, another one, uh, yeah, just behind. Thank you, thank you, everyone, for the for this very interesting, uh, insightful uh, panel. I have a question. I was just thinking through the presentation from the from the points that Sid mentioned about uh, creating an environment uh, in uh, that Accenture has in several uh, offices in the world, building one here in uh, in Singapore, where we bring innovators, solution providers, and of course resources from Accenture to solve new problems. And then I have the, here the question for the audience, for, for you guys uh, in the panel is, how can we digitize this environment? Because of course it's not scalable. Uh, I'm sure Accenture has uh, a tactical way to create those offices, those environments, uh, and it cannot be, has a, has a limit in terms of scalability, but how can we, for one, digitize in order to scale this co-innovation environment? So who wants to answer? Let me, let me take, a, take a go at this. It's a really interesting question. And we were um, in one of the plenaries early on, we were discussing this. 
Um, and this is a real example uh, uh, from, from us, and I was directly involved in this. Um, you see, one of the key challenges that senior executives today have on the topic of co-innovation and digitization is how do I ensure that only 20, 30 people on a topic of digital are not smart and the rest of the organization doesn't know what is happening. And so you're deepening the divide as opposed to take everybody on a journey. We found a startup in Singapore that created a simple app and uh, they, they're called Gametize, so I'll give them credit for this. Um, and they created a simple app where you could enable learning programs on different topics, and those topics could be linked to whatever the organization on, is interested in, to my job profile, to the learning curriculum of, of, of the year. And every day, I would get a new game as a pop-up on that app. And it would be a two to three minute game, and I would do that game and compete with my peers and have a leaderboard, etc. We've taken that now and we've rolled it out to an organization, 45,000 employees of an organization, which is in the region, I can't name the client. And if the CEO wants to post a video, there is no more email with a link and then you press the link, it will open another web page, it will buffer because your internet speed is not good and then you're like, okay, I'll come back to it later. As opposed to that, everything now happens using that app. So I just wanted to kind of you know, answer your question in, by this example, that there are ways and means in which we are bringing this to life. Other questions from the audience? Yeah, being in building or, or industry environment, uh, what is your experience in terms of confidentiality of data versus openness of this data? I think Jean-Marc is a perfect question for you. Yeah, good question because we, we've got as a customer also some people in the construction like uh, Bouig or Vinci or ICAD, maybe you know them well, of course. And we are working with them because they are trying to find a new model, uh, knowing that all the data with, uh, with, uh, with flow from the building, but also inside. And as you know, with connecting, for example, a light, you can know uh, count the number of person in a room with uh, things and this is it may be a confidential information so for example they are imagining now to propose some new uh, new contract with a person we, who will uh, get some offices in their building including some new uh, some new aspect uh, meaning how how why do you accept that that this data concerning your office will be shared so first step, mandatory, this is for security reason, okay, it will be shared for the, the person exploiting the, the, the building. Second step, do you accept that this data uh, will be shared with a third part? Maybe in, counter, in, in counterpart, you will gain some free application for uh, meeting rooms, uh, plan, planning, etc. Maybe third step, uh, do you accept to widely share some information outside of the building uh, uh, in counterpart of I don't know what? So, the model has to be uh, invented, but uh, just this person uh, are thinking about it and making concrete projects now at this time uh, and proposing to their new customers and partners to do that. So uh, it's n I know the solution and the perfect answer to your question, but uh, uh, there is uh, always something to, 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 to choose between uh, uh, how, how open you, will, uh, you could be and the benefit you can, you can gain in counterpart. So. Completely agree with that. I'd just like to add that globally we are seeing uh, something new that is emerging over the last three, four years, which is the formation of consortiums uh, with traditional competitors in it. Um, and the way they are looking at it, they are saying that if I want to do predictive asset maintenance on a blower, now if all of us have cumulatively be between the four or five pe companies that are part of the consortium, 120 facilities, all of which have blowers, all of us face the same problem. And so let us share the data specific to that asset and then have a predictive asset maintenance model created for it, which will then cumulatively help all of us. So yes, the lines are still a bit hard to define, uh, but I think, like you're saying, your mark, it's, it's, it is certainly getting easier now. 
So I th I'm really glad you brought that up, Sid. I think it's a, that's definitely where things are heading. If you talk to a company, you say, okay, uh, you know, let's share your production data, of course, nobody wants to do that. And there's actually very little value in that, apart from maybe their direct competitors or somebody who wants to trade in the stock market. But if you say, okay, we'll take that data and we'll derive models from it and we can share that amongst everyone, then there's value to that because they see and they're thankfully open-eyed enough to realize that fine, it might help their competitors, but they'll also benefit from that as well. And everybody will improve efficiency, improve uptime. One, one more thing. Maybe it's often interesting to, to look at other sectors, uh, which are also uh, very confidential, like uh, health. Uh, you've got some big company like Johnson & Johnson, uh, which is a big company in, uh, in, in uh, drugs uh, for making and so on. And uh, they, they started to open tons and tons of data. They, they are knowing uh, about, the, about the, the, the period before launching the, a new medicine. And uh, they knew that by doing that, they will leave some information to the competition. But they also knew by, that by doing that, uh, they will attract to themselves the best innovators, the best researchers, the best students. Uh, and then in the competition, in terms of uh, speed, they will, they will win. That, that's the assumption they do. We'll see in the future. But. I think this aspect of uh, uh, how do we attract uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the best innovators, the edge of innovation is important. And, and those best innovators, whether they come from academia or other environments, they want to see things in a different way. They want to operate in a different environment that is not where everybody is isolated in that bubble. I think that's a very important uh, factor. Sorry, uh, Chintan. No, I was saying that you know uh, a lot of our customers come back to us and say that uh, you know compared to our peers in that same industry, how are we operating? For example, mm -hmm. you go to a textile and they would say that tell us how the compressor is used in our factory uh, versus the competitors or the like um, uh, organizations that you work with, and and I was really surprised that they actually want us to benchmark mm -hmm. their facility and their equipment. Um, but uh, that allowed us to share the, the sort of operating parameters in that uh, industry with their peers, and they were very happy about mm -hmm. it. So I think that the barrier that, why should I share my data, uh, is slowly starting to, to go down, unless it, like, Alex said it is production data, which nobody wants to share, but uh, at the end of the day, what can you derive out of electrical parameters mm. of an equipment that is placed in an industry, right? So, so, it, so it's probably changing when you start to drive the conversation with customers about the value of the data and not just about the data themselves. Absolutely. So if you say to a customer, if you give me these ads and I return this value to you, I guess that the conversation is yeah. much easier. And, and if you start your conversation with the IT team of the organization, yeah. it's not going to go anywhere, right? And so you, you, and you start <laughs> with the IT and say, open all of your gateways and give me all your data. Exactly. This so rubric doesn't bring you anywhere. Anyway, so that you, you start talking to the business guys, they are very happy to drive the IT team to share the data mm -hmm. you know, uh, of the equipment that they work with. And, and it's important that you mention that because when, when I was presenting ecosystem earlier, we might interact with the same companies, but we interact with different people in the same companies. They have people that have different roles and different responsibilities that now become part of those discussions where they were not before. Uh, when before it was a, a technology-centric conversation about some elements of the architecture, infrastructure, whatever, now we get to speak more with the users, we get to speak more with the people that are actually going to consume the value of the data that we have uh, part of the uh, uh, conversation. So actually innovating, like coming back to the innovation part and, and co-innovating uh, with the stakeholders, this is what we learned when we started working with the customers as a um, sounding board. And, and the first advice that they got, we got was, if you start your conversation with an IT department of an organization, you need to say these things. Mm -hmm. And if you start talking to the maintenance team, you need to say these things. And this is what, what helped us you know, get our customers even faster. So we still have five minutes. Do we have more questions from the audience? So we have two actually, so we, we have one here and we'll have another one, I think, behind. And another one over here, okay. All right, thank you, awesome discussion. Uh, so a question about consortia um, forming and more broadly about how the linear ecosystem changes into a networked 
uh, linear value chain changes into a networked ecosystem. And I'm curious how that process really starts. Is it uh, gradual or is it a phase change? And who drives that? Is it one leader or is it sort of an organizational thinking? Uh, just curious if you have stories around that. Thank you. Who volunteers? Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to how to I'm trying to answer this without uh, giving out too much details because of the sensitivities. But usually there is uh, a, a third party involved, and uh, usually um, you know there is uh, an innovation based uh, theme that brings these uh, consortium parties together. So I know of three examples where uh, there are consortiums being formed. In one of the cases, uh, the government is involved and it's a, it's a small nation um, and uh, you know the government uh, is, is kind of uh, pushing for innovation within the sector. And uh, what is really happening behind the scenes is every organization is kind of going in and saying, I want help and this is my journey and this is what I want to do. And when, uh, when, when these government organizations uh, begin to kind of see the similarity between what everybody is trying to drive within an industry, then bringing everybody together on the same platform becomes easy. Um, the devil is in the details. Um, uh, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of nuances, there are a lot of do's and don'ts. People are constantly figuring out how they can extract value. Um, uh, at the same time contributing towards that platform. It's not easy, uh, but if you thought about this eight to ten years back, um, I don't know any that existed mm. then. So I think we had another question in the audience, uh, maybe just over here, you, you had a question? No? Okay, so we have a question just over there, if somebody can bring the mic. Just in the back in the corner, yes. Uh, my question, uh, by the way, I'm Romeo from Nestle. Uh, my question is, is related to predictive maintenance, to Mr. Chandy. Um, as we know, the predictive maintenance on mechanical related equipment is, or, is quite established. And uh, we have proven that this one works quite well. But on the electrical, and electronic related equipment. The predictive maintenance somehow is, I want to understand if you already have a system that can predict the potential failure of an electrical equipment. Because the, for mechanical, the potential failure is gradual. While for electrical, it's running and suddenly it's down. And a lot of the unplanned downtime in the factory is somehow related to electrical and electronic component uh, equipment. So do you have advancement in this aspect of predictive maintenance? That's the question. Sorry, so um, if I can ask the question, when you say electrical equipment, what does that mean? A, a PLC? It's an example. PLC or uh, uh, a network? Uh, electrical network? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, taking the electrical network first, you know, um, we, w we work with a lot of industries where we start taking data from various points in an electrical network. And this could be a hierarchy coming in from the incomer of a transformer to a distribution board to, uh, um, to a machine at the end, right? Now, when we start looking at the data starting from the transformer till the machine level, um, it is very evident that you will start seeing some amount of losses in the uh, in the entire electrical network. Sorry, I'm getting a little technical, but uh, it's possible. Um, there are a few electrical parameters that we have used to derive a digital twin of an entire electrical factory. And very clearly, you can see a degradation in electronic components as well 
which can predict failure. I don't know if we can predict failure in terms of time, uh, but you can definitely predict failure in terms of uh, days or uh, weeks um, in some of the components. So, for example, a capacitor bank, yes. right? A capacitor bank, when operating in a very low consumption environment, starts to consume power. And when it starts consuming power, it, the charging and the discharging cycle of the capacitor bank becomes higher. And when, if you see the pattern of charging and discharging of a capacitor bank, you will see that when it starts to degrade, it reaches to a point where it will fail. So, so to complement what, what was just said, I think, I think there is an interesting example here on this type of application. I think we have probably with the constructor power, we have uh, an offer called, called um, uh, Asset Advisor, Electrical Asset Advisor, that is exactly about the applications that you describe. So taking telemetry data from equipment, aging models of the equipment, combining all this with analytics, and as you said, not necessarily like in mechanical predictive maintenance, not predicting the equipment is going to fail in um, uh, 10 days because it's not a continuous mode, but say, uh, assessing for each equipment, we believe that the probability of failure of that equipment based on the parameters is 1%, 5%, 10%. And we have customers using that type of offers today, like hospitals, that want to be able in their infrastructure to assess the risk of failure based on many, many parameters, because the risk of failure of an equipment uh, in the uh, lobby of an hospital or in the operating room has totally different consequences. So uh, that's the Schneider Electric answer to your question, but we have actually an example years that you can go and, and have a look. Yeah, I, and I'll tell you, um, we at, at Equilibrium believe that any change in mechanical behavior of an equipment, whether it's a motor, transformer, compressor, capacitor bank, any of these, it results into an electrical signature. Anything that you take. Mm. And if you look at that electrical signature, the severity of that signature will tell you till what extent it has degraded. The key is, how do you say that at this point of time, it still has 15 days of life left? That's right, yes. I so think a, a good example will be the variable frequency drive. Absolutely. So if you see the data of the variable frequency drive where the motor is connected, you will see that the signature of that motor will tell you whether there is a bearing failure, or there is a rotor problem, or there is a mm -hmm. stator problem. And that's what we expertise in. So if you want to take a look at the demo, you can look at our booth. Thank you very much. So I, I cannot take more questions because we are over time. So I, I just want to uh, thank you. Uh, as I said, you were the very motiva motivated group that preferred listening to that discussions and go uh, eating. So thanks for that. Uh, I hope there is still some food for you. Uh, so I, I want to thank my, my panelists for joining us today. They are a great panelist and great partner for uh, Schneider Electric as well. I want also to invite you, uh, uh, for those of you that have not done it yet, to visit the uh, Schneider Electric Exchange booth. Uh, Electric exchange is our answer to these topics that we have been discussing today. So how, how do we uh, bring tools, capabilities, activate the ecosystem uh, with digital means uh, in order to uh, create new solutions, in order to collaborate, in order to create those new solutions, and in order to help each of the different partners and the ecosystem in general to scale uh, its business. So uh, it's called Schneider Electric Exchange. I, I invite you to visit the booth, register, join, and be part of the community and be part of this transformation. Thanks to all and, and thanks for the audience.